Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the latest edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show, coming at you as I love to do every weekday over the airwaves of ESPN Radio. 250 plus markets across the United States of America. And of course, the Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio, Sirius XM style, Channel 80 as well. The number to call up is 888-729-3776. That's 888-SAY-ESPN. It's time for some Straight Talk brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless, best phones, best networks, no contracts. You know, I cannot believe the idiots out here, and I'm not talking about my contemporaries in the media because we got to report what we have to report. So if you got the media out there and the New England Patriots swearing that Tom Brady has hurt his right hand, that Tom Brady walking around a little slinky may not be ready, or he's not going to be 100%, he's not going to be ready for the AFC Championship game to go up against the Jacksonville Jaguars and that vaunted defense. Anybody who believes that nonsense, I got some swamp land in East Rutherford, New Jersey, to sell to you. I mean, can we really, really spare me? I can't believe that I am compelled to start off my radio show by bringing up something that I don't even consider news. Because I got news for you. It's very, very simple to me, ladies and gentlemen. If Tom Brady was really hurt, do you think Bill Belichick would ever let us know? Do you think Bill Belichick would ever let the Jacksonville Jaguars know? I mean, it's just such an utterly ridiculous storyline that a five-time champion who's been to seven Super Bowls, who's played through a myriad of nicks and knacks throughout his career, whose team obviously is in position for the seventh consecutive time. They are just 60 minutes away from a Super Bowl appearance. And I'm supposed to be worried that Tom Brady might have hurt his pinky. Really? Really? I mean, come on now. I don't have time for this nonsense. I'm obligated to report it. It is ESPN. It is the worldwide leader. This is the news that is circulating. And I guess we have to discuss it. See, this is the reason why I po- why I have suddenly politicked for knowing I will never get to be a commentator on Monday Night Football. This is the reason. Because, because, see, I'm the type of person. I'd be the Jeff Van Gundy of Monday Night Football. I'd be going off like, please, why are we wasting time? Why are we wasting time with this non-story? I could be in a book. I could see myself in a booth now with another color commentator and a play-by-play guy. Can we move on? Are we really supposed to take this seriously that Tom Brady has hurt himself? He's hurt his hand. Oh, my Lord. Tom Brady's not going to be able to go. Oh, stop it. It's a waste of time. Now, I mean, personally, I would I, I would prefer to elevate myself and be gifted enough where I would warrant comparisons to the late, great Howard Cosell, God rest his soul. But I ain't that damn lucky. And I digress from the bigger point. The bigger point is there's no story here. Tom Brady will be ready Sunday. The Jacksonville Jaguars, even with their elite defense, courtesy of Jalen Ramsey talking smack, uh, their defense in Jacksonville might be in a little bit of trouble. Unless you're one of those people that believe what Max Kellerman believes, that, you know, Tom Coughlin, formerly of the New York Giants, now a VP with the Jacksonville Jaguars, will have this team ready, even though he ain't the damn coach. Believe what you want. Believe what you want. I would remind everybody that the Jacksonville Jaguars, with the vaunted number two overall defense, did surrender 35 points to the Pittsburgh Steelers last Sunday. I remind everybody about that. I know they scored 45. Or the Pittsburgh Steelers scored 42, rather. But 35 points legitimately were surrendered by Jacksonville's defense. I'd like to remind everybody of that reality, just in case you forgot. To make sure we get that out of the way. It's very, very important. Number to call up, as always, is 888-729-3776. That's 888-SAY-ESPN. Plus, you can catch me on my Twitter handle, at Stephen A. Stephen A. Smith, rather. And of course, on Facebook, it's Stephen A. as well. This is the one thing. You know, we talk about this, and we talk about Tom Brady and the New England Patriots. We need to talk about who's gone. We need to talk about the Pittsburgh Steelers, too. Because, see, news is circulating and percolating in the streets of New York City, in case y'all missed it. Todd Haley, the former offensive coordinator for the Pittsburgh Steelers, essentially unceremoniously dismissed yesterday by Mike Tomlin, is on the market. And because the Steelers had a top three offense, 
and I believe that Todd Haley, with all due respect, has been railroaded by Big Ben Roethlisberger because if the quarterback wanted him to stay, Todd Haley would still be there as the offensive coordinator. Let's call it what it is. The quarterback coach is going to be elevated to the offensive coordinator, Mr. Randy Fickner. He is a guy that gets along very, very well with Big Ben Roethlisberger. I'm sick and tired of hearing these damn stories. I'm sick and tired of these stories where there's some offensive coordinator that gets so gets along so well with the quarterback, and as a result, they get elevated. Somebody gets elevated from a coordinator to a head coaching position or from a positional coach to a coordinator's position because they have great relationships. Damn the relationships. Do you produce? Todd Haley produced. If you're going to let him go, let him go. But I don't think all of these stories are fair to him where we're hearing about his relationship or lack thereof and how you wish that he had a better relationship with Big Ben Roethlisberger. Big Ben Roethlisberger got sacked less over the last three years than ever before. Big Ben Roethlisberger was prolific over the last few years than he ever was before. Antonio Brown had five consecutive 100 reception seasons under Todd Haley. The offense was ranked in the top three to five over the last four years. Now, I'm not trying to paint the man as a saint or anything like that. You give me a choice between him and Tomlin, I'm picking Tomlin all day, every day. Let's not, let's not, let's not lose perspective. But Todd Haley doesn't deserve to be excoriated like he was some bum that got in the way of the Steelers' success. By and large, he contributed to their success. And right now, percolating throughout the streets of New York City to the point where my idiotic producers, who I love daily, but damn it, they are idiotic. His name is Jonathan Winthrop, to be specific. This dude is talking about how Todd Haley is a good choice to be the head coach. Let's pump the brakes on that. Because here's the reality. Todd Haley knows football. Todd Haley can be an offensive coordinator. Todd Haley is not a leader of men. That's where your problem lies. There is a difference between doing your job and being an overseer of men. There's a difference, especially in the NFL. And when it comes to the NFL, let's understand something incredibly, incredibly important. You cannot have somebody That's a bit eccentric. That can be cantankerous, even belligerent to some degree. You cannot have him as the head coach of New York City. He'll get eaten alive. He'll get eaten alive. You leaving notes on napkins at bars. You depart from bars with your pelvic jammed up because because you might have slipped on stairs or got beat up because you were a little inebriated, depending on what stories you believe. You cannot have an offensive coordinator with a suspect background in terms of his relationships or, dare I say, his behavior, being a head coach in New York City. It's a disaster waiting to happen. You got to be disciplined. You cannot go that route if you are New York. People are talking about that with the Giants and the Jets or whatever. Todd Bowles is coaching New York Jets. Should, should he consider Todd Haley as an offensive coordinator? Sure, I don't mind. But last time I checked, Todd Haley needs something to work with. And Josh McCown ain't no damn Big Ben Roethlisberger. And Anderson and Severin Jenkins and all of these boys, you know, they ain't Antonio Brown. There's no Le'Veon Bell on this roster. Last time I checked, it was the likes of Matt Forte. No disrespect. So let's bump the brakes. And let's keep things in its proper perspective. Let's understand what this is. Todd Haley didn't deserve to be unceremoniously dismissed. Dismiss him, sure, but we don't need to be talking about him like he didn't do the job because he did. That's number one. Number two, you want him in New York as an offensive coordinator? I'm all for that. Don't talk to me about him as a head coach. I want to hear it. And number three, can we stop with the bogus stories about Tom Brady being injured? If he were truly injured, Bill Belichick would lie about that. And you damn well know it. Don't let me sick my man Carlton and tamp on you. Don't let me do that. Bill Belichick would never tell the truth about that. Let's be very, very clear with that. 888-729-3776. 888-SAY-ESPN. By the way, I don't need to wait till Friday. I'm picking the New England Patriots to come out of the AFC. I'm picking the Philadelphia Eagles to beat the Vikings in the NFC Championship game Sunday night. And we can spend the next two days talking about just that.
Live right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show. That was Straight Talk Wireless Nationwide Coverage on America's largest and most dependable 4G LTE networks. You are listening live to the Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio. Back with more and then some in a minute. Craving even more of Stephen A. Him of all people. For around the clock access to the man. I'm Stephen A. You can follow him on Twitter and Instagram at Stephen A. Smith and on Facebook at Stephen A. Welcome back to Stephen A. Smith show right here on ESPN Radio. Coming at you as I love to do every weekday over the airwaves of ESPN Radio. Sirius XM, Channel 80, 250 plus markets across the United States of America. Check your local listings. And I'm quite sure you will find me. The number to call up as always is 888-729-3776. That's 888-SAY-ESPN. See, one of the reasons, it's just like people, look, I'm a native New Yorker. You know, I'm a transplant to L.A. too because I'm in L.A. a lot because I love the sunshine, the weather, the palm trees. Well, damn it, let me stop lying. I just love the scenery. It's La La. Okay, you don't see me looking to get to San Francisco. All right? Even though there's nice folks out there. But L.A. is just tough. Special. Let's just leave it at that. But I will tell you this. The interesting thing about about just thinking about things. I'm from New York and y'all got me praising Tom Brady. This is not what I enjoy doing. He plays for that other team. Foxborough, Massachusetts, Boston, Massachusetts is what he represents. I'm a New Yorker. I don't enjoy praising him, but I must be honest. 66,000 yards passing in his career. 66,000. 488 touchdowns, just 160 interceptions. A a career quarterback rating of 97.6. This year, at age 40, 40, 4,577 yards passing, 32 touchdowns, 8 interceptions, a a 13-3 and record. A candidate for league MVP on this. And oh, by the way, the man is 196 and 55 as a starting quarterback. And y'all are talking to me about Tom Brady? I mean, look, what do you want me to say? Tom Brady is sensational. Can we stop acting like we don't know? Can we stop acting like we don't know? He's that gifted. He's that gifted. And and by the way, do y'all realize that with the exception of his injury in 2008 in the first game of the season, for the 2008 season, do y'all realize that the only game, the only games that Tom Brady has missed throughout his entire career since 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 2002 is the four-game suspension he's received last year for the Flake game? The man doesn't miss games. He doesn't miss games. And y'all are telling me he hurt his hand, handing the ball off to one of those runners in practice, that Tom Brady's going to miss the AFC Championship game? Or Tom Brady's in danger? Stop. Stop wasting my time. Y'all are almost wasting my time as much as these damn referees in the NBA are wasting my time. And I'll get to them in just a little while. Don't you worry about that. 888 is 888-SAY-ESPN. Let's go to the phones. Brian and Callie, you're live with Stephen A. Talk to me. How's it going, Stephen A.? Thanks for taking my call. All right, go ahead, man. You're absolutely right, man. It's pretty bogus on this injury to Tom Brady's hand, but I'm just curious to what you think. Do you think it's some type of angle that they're trying to take or trying to, trying to make, I mean? <clears throat> well, listen, against Jacksonville's defense and the way everybody's talking about it, um, listen, the bottom line is you just never know. It's entirely plausible. Bill Belichick will use every trick in the book. Teddy Bruschi came on my show first take on ESPN2 every weekday morning, 10 a.m. Eastern at 12 noon. Teddy Bruschi, a three-time champion with the New England Patriots, came on the show and said when he played for Bill Belichick, Bill Belichick told the players all the time, make sure to spray the perfume. Spray the perfume. You know, just flood the opponents with compliments. Don't give them any bulletin board material whatsoever. Let them do that. You make sure you don't. Just be ready to play come Sunday. And look at what has happened. Look at how that's worked out for everybody that has played for Bill Belichick in New England. Right. One one more thing. One more thing. 
I really don't have faith in Blake Bortles because, you know, he's not really shown up to be the quarterback that everybody thought he was going to be. He did be, last but. week, bro. He did last week. He did last week. Let's be honest and, and let's be honest and fair and give credit where it's due. And by the way, my producer is telling me that Brady missed the whole season uh, with the exception of game one in 2008. Evidently, my own producer is not listening to me because I do believe I said that before I said he missed the four games last year. I said with the exception, Cat Pastor, my other producer, tell the truth. I said with the exception of the one game he played where he got injured in 2008, forcing him to miss the whole season. He's never missed a game other than the Flake Gate since 2002. But my other producer apparently didn't hear that part. Jonathan Winthrop, you need to listen. Go ahead. Go ahead, Brian. Go ahead. There's no, yeah, there's absolutely no, no way he's missing the AFC championship game. He's not going to miss it and he's not going to underperform. He's not going to underperform. Max Kellerman actually came on my, sh- on, on first take today and this man sat up there and said with a straight face that Brady has more to prove than Blake Bortles, Nick Foles, or Case Keenum. Because the New England got, New England Patriots got rid of Garoppolo and you're basically saying Brady's the man. So Brady's got to show up and produce. I'm like, please, please spare me. Not trying to hear that at all. Not trying to hear it at all. Appreciate the call, Brian. Thank you so much. I got distracted by the television for a second because apparently Scandal debuts tonight. The final season, I forgot. Olivia Pope, a.k.a. Kerry Washington. I totally, totally forgot that the, the, the season, I thought the season debut was next week. It's tonight. I ain't missing Scandal tonight on ABC. Make sure y'all don't miss it either. Back to the calls. Omar, Connecticut, you're live with Stephen A. What's up? What's going on, Stephen A.? I'm all right. Go ahead, man. Hey, uh, don't you think the Tom Brady injury is uh, more news than Lavar Balls than whatever's coming out of his mouth? Um, you sound a bit muffled. I need you to turn away from, step away from the mic a little bit so I can hear you clearly because I didn't understand your point. Don't you think that Tom Brady's injury is more news than whatever's coming out of Lavar Balls' mouth? Well, Tom, you, uh, yeah, right now, sure. Why? Because I think. Lavar Ball has never said anything that is true. Everything he says is a lie. Well, so what does that have to do with anything? We just thought Tom Brady, we just found out that he may have been injured 24 hours ago. What does that have to do with Lavar Ball? Because you're saying Tom Brady's injury is not a, it's not a news. You shouldn't be covering it. Well, what I'm saying to you is that I think it's a lie. I think that, in other words, they're trying to sit up there and hoodwink folks and hopefully the Jacksonville Jaguars into believing that Tom Brady is considerably less than 100% so they can underestimate, they can underestimate New England and, and slip up and New England could take advantage of it from an opposition perspective. That's all I meant. So what, what's the difference between what LeVar Ball is doing? Well, LeVar Ball doesn't have to play. Tom Brady does. That would be the difference. I know you tried to be smart and slick. But you ain't on this level. You can't catch me off guard with that. Have a nice day. What do you mean what LeVar Ball has to do with that? LeVar Ball can talk all the, all the junk he wants. Lonzo Ball has to cash those checks. And in Lithuania, LiAngelo and LaMelo have to cash those checks. New England can say what they want about Tom Brady, but Tom Brady will be out on the field to show us. That is the difference. Evidently, the brother in Connecticut couldn't understand that. I'm a robot vacuum cleaner, so yeah, I got one gig. I suck up dirt, so pardon my inferiority complex about GEICO, who does so much more. Like, not only could they save their customers money on car insurance, but they got fast and friendly claim service, too, and an award-winning mobile app, plus access to licensed agents 24-7. Who am I kidding? I can't even do corners. Uh Uh-oh, choking hazard. (gasps) Popcorn girdles. GEICO. Expect great savings and a whole lot more. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Let me say this about something that's really, really on my mind, and I'm really bothered about it in all seriousness. I was watching, uh, torturing myself, watching my favorite basketball team, the New York Knicks, lose yet another game last night. One of the things that really irked my nerves to no end was watching referee, a referee I respect, uh, who's done an outstanding job throughout his career as an NBA official, His name is Derek Stafford, and he issued a technical foul to Courtney Lee of the New York Knicks. Now, Courtney Lee of the New York Knicks, please understand something here. He's arguing with a player, okay? That's what he's doing. 
He's arguing with a player. And this is a guy that, um, you know, I'm just looking at him. This rookie out of Oregon from last, his name is Dylan, I believe. Um, He's arguing with the kid. The kid grabs, not nothing flagrant, nothing demonstrative, but the kid, you know, grabs his arm. He flails him off. The kid, the kid rips on the back of his jersey. He nudges him during a jump ball. The referee stops. The two are talking to each other, and he gives Courtney Lee a technical foul. Courtney Lee is like, what did I do? What did I do? And Derek Safford ultimately issues a statement talking about inappropriate language. Really? Now, you got to understand something, ladies and gentlemen. I have no problem with an official that wants to tee you up because you're speaking very demonstrably and disrespectfully so towards the official. I have no problem with an official who's warning guys excessively because he's fearful that a fight might break out and he wants to reel that in, take control of the game. We understand that. We truly, truly do. The Joey Crawfords of the world and and, and, and others throughout NBA history, we, we get it. We understand. But we are living in a day and age right now where LeBron James, the greatest player in the world, clearly box office, has been ejected. Steph Curry, the greatest shooter in the world, a two-time league MVP and a two-time champion, has been ejected for a game. Russell Westbrook, arguably the most exciting player in the NBA, a superstar, the greatest athletic point guard we've ever seen, is getting ejected. Kevin Durant, one of the top two players on the planet Earth, as far as I'm concerned, is getting ejected. And nobody's thinking anything about it. And then when the Clippers and the Houston Rockets get into it at the Staples Center the other day, and that follows up by Aaron Aflalo swinging on an Orlando Magic the other day, we want to talk about image issues. Has anybody taken into consideration that the NBA officials may be culprits in all of this? Because maybe if you weren't so eager and willing to give out texts like they're a bag of Skittles, and you're throwing dudes out of the game that people pay their hard-earned money to come and see, maybe the NBA wouldn't be having questions about an image issue, which, by the way, I think is bogus. These guys do a tremendous job. The players, in terms of their community work, their social activism, etc. The NBA as a league has done a good job. The NBA officials do a highly credible job of officiating this game, even though they make mistakes from time to time. But my God, you're just going to throw guys out of the game or issue texts and think nobody notices? That gives Joe Public out there an excuse to label these these players as problems. How long do you think it's going to be before people start looking at the players and going like this? Well, you know, we really, really have to address this. I mean, my God, maybe Stephen A., they should be in anger management class. I mean, my Lord. Hockey players punching people in the face and hitting them with slapstick shots. Pucks flying everywhere. Crashing into the glass. Baseball players, clubhouses and dugouts are emptying. Brawls are taking place on a baseball field. We'll manage ourselves. A basketball player has bad breath. A football player takes a knee. And oh my God, Armageddon has arrived. Don't get me started on that. But my real overlying point, as it pertains specifically to NBA officials, is you don't recognize that we live in a different day and age? You don't recognize the fact? That when you are so willing to give out texts and eject people from game, that contributes, that contributes to the league's reputation being sullied. You don't get that. You don't understand that. The NBA officials are just as responsible as the players and the coaches and the league office to uphold and help build 
the brand that is the NBA. You got a meeting coming up in Los Angeles with Michelle Roberts, the executive director of the NBA Players Association, with Chris Paul, the president of the association. And I don't give a damn about me getting on Chris Paul the other day about his leadership role and that stuff that took place in L.A. at the Staples Center. That's one incident. That doesn't take away from the character that this man has and how good of a person he is and how consummate of a professional he is and how great of a player he is. And Michelle Roberts is a good woman. So the NBA referees that want to sit down and talk to her and Chris Paul, God bless you. But you can't look at them and put it on the players to uphold the league and absolve yourself from responsibility and culpability in that regard. You have just as much of a responsibility to uphold the league. You ain't separate and apart from the league. If you are an official, you have an obligation, just like the players, to conduct yourself accordingly. What about when this guy, Kurt, Courtney Kirkland, was button heads with Sean Livingston. I watched that. Sean Livingston didn't instigate that headbutt scenario. That was Kirkland who did that. You're an official for Christ's sakes. And as far as I'm concerned, nobody has said this, so I'm going to say this. These NBA officials are starting to get like the Major League Baseball officials, where you instigating and antagonizing players. It ain't right. We don't pay to see y'all. And I'm not saying they're always wrong because that's irresponsible and false. What I'm saying is you don't have to be as excessive as you've been sometimes and so eager to give out text and throw people out of games. It ain't right. And it contributes to the negative publicity that the league gets with its players. And it ain't right. You got an obligation to uphold the standard too. Somebody need to say it, so damn it, I did. NBA officials do not get a pass on this. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Let's go to my man Carlton in Tampa. You're live with Stephen A. Talk to me, buddy. How are you? Hey, I'm good. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you for calling. What's up? I want to talk referees, but I want to talk NFL referees. Okay, go ahead. Okay, uh, the uh, the crew for uh, the uh, New England game was named uh, for, for for Sunday's New England game, and it's okay. Cleet Blakeman. Cleet Blakeman has refed been the head ref of six New England games. New England is two and four when he's been on the field. So I think the NFL is hearing, uh, you know, the pressure of how the calls have gone three to one against the Patriots' opponents the last four games, and they're trying to assign somebody, somebody who might have an objective bone in their body to hit up that ref- referee group. But Tony Sterator is the back judge. He's, uh, he's good old Gene Sterator's older brother. And so I got to do some research on, on pass interference calls that he's called this year because he's going to be the guy throwing oh, the flag. Oh, Lord. You're, you're, as I you're said, doing your research the, to set the stage the so when New England Bills, wins another game, another AFC championship game, you're going to point out how it's Bill Belichick. He won't stop. He won't stop cheating. That's where the, you're going, Carlton. The Jacksonville Jaguars were not called called for a single defensive holding or pass interference call against the Steelers, even though Bouye and, and uh, Ramsey were mugging the Steelers receivers. And I predict, I predict, Steve A., they'll be called for at least three defensive holding or pass interference calls by Mr. Starator there. We shall see. I like the idea that Cleve ba- Blakeman is the, is the head ref because he certainly hasn't been a, a Patriots favorite there, you know, given that they've probably lost more when he's been the head ref than anybody else. One more point, Stephen A. Go ahead. The, the reason why Haley is gone, okay, the Steelers' two most important games this year, the game against the Patriots and, of course, the Jacksonville. Yeah, we know, that. we know that they, bots call at the end. No question about that. Oh, they completely botched the end of the Patriots' uh, game, especially that two-yard pass when they had 28 seconds to go and he tackled inbounds. And, of course, that led to the disastrous interception one play later. And, and of course, uh, Haley had had, what, six or seven minutes while they were reviewing the Jesse James call to get his offense aligned, what they were going to do on the next three plays, and he botched it. And then the two fourth down 
low percentage calls that they got stuck both times in, in the playoff game. Somebody had to pay for that. Now I'm just wondering, when the heck is somebody on the defensive side going to pay for their wretched secondary? Because well, that's the next person. Well, that I, 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 don't think there's any question, I don't think there's any question about that, but I also don't think it was because of this play, a couple of botched plays this season. The fact is, Todd Haley had been here for six years. He walked into this season in the last year of his contract, and there was speculation long before those mistakes were made that the Steelers were going to make a change. And I think it had a lot to do with his relationship, particularly with Big Ben, and obviously – uh, you listen, this is why Fichtner, Fich, Fich, Fichtner, you know, has developed and cultivated a relationship with Big Ben to the point where they're going to take him from the quarterback coaching position and put him in as the offensive coordinator, primarily due to his great relationship with Big Ben. But you know what? Dirk Cutter had a great relationship with Jameis Winston to the point where they booted Lovey Smith out the door in Tampa, and look where that got them. Yeah. Well, you know, Roethlisberger, I, I don't know if it was Roethlisberger pointed it out or the columnist that pointed it out, that he, he has been successful on 18 out of 19 one-yard quarterback sneaks in his life. Right. And he's saying, I don't know why we're not calling that That's darn right. thing. So obviously he had a problem with these darn play calls. Not only that, but at the end of the Patriots game. So somebody was going to have to pay for that. Because it doesn't matter if you have the best offense in the NFL, if at the critical moments in playoff games or the Super Bowl, you lose your mind like Pete Carroll did, not giving the ball to Marshawn Lynch three times from the half-yard line. You know, so it doesn't really matter. You destroy the entire season if you can't keep your head in those moments. I got you. And the, and the Steelers couldn't do it this year. Thanks a lot, buddy. I appreciate the call. All good points. No question about it. I agree with you on every single point that you made. No doubt. Let's go to Byron in Maine. You're live with Stephen A. Go ahead, Byron. Hi, Stephen A. Thanks for taking my call. Go ahead, buddy. <laughs> I want to change... Uh, the pace a little bit. My my concern is not the officiating, but your opinion I would like to get on the LeBron James Michael Jordan comparison. You hear a lot of it all the time. What I would like to see done is the people that have the films of Michael playing through his years that are matching LeBron's age and his years right now. Um, it doesn't matter to I, me. It doesn't matter to me. LeBron James as a talent is a freak of nature and a once-in-a-lifetime player. 6'9", 260, can handle the ball, uh, can pass. His basketball IQ is off the charts. He's a physical specimen. He's reliable health-wise. All of those things are true. And I would still take Jordan any day of the week and twice on Sundays because LeBron did not did not have that killer instinct. He does not have a closers mentality. He will produce for you. He will put up numbers. He will he will keep you competitive. All those things are true. But when it's really time to close the deal, that is not the person that I'm going to rely upon. And when I think about Michael Jordan, I see a closer. I see the greatest assassin that the game has ever known. No, he's not 260 pounds. No, he can't beat you the way LeBron James could beat you, but he can will you to victory. And, for example, even with the troubles and the issues that the Cleveland Cavaliers are having this year, we heard the same thing from LeBron in the, in the conference championship games. You know, after they beat Boston, he was talking about he was so stressed he didn't even want to think about it. Why? Because of, oh, look at how tough the Golden State Warriors are going to be. You didn't hear that from Michael Jordan. That's why he was 6-0 in the NBA Finals. Yeah, LeBron's talent is not into question. It's his his mentality exactly. during the games or at the end of games. Exactly. You never saw Michael. I never saw Michael not play with intensity. I can see games, even the last few, against Toronto that's just been played. I see LeBron being the last Cleveland Cavaliers down the floor, not on a fast break, but just walking with his hands completely at his side. Yeah, I see a guy that was talking yesterday basically preparing all of us for the Cleveland Cavaliers finishing in second place again. That's what I see in here when I'm looking at LeBron James right now, a team and a player that knows they can't beat the Golden State Warriors. You'd have never seen that from Michael Jordan. You'd have never seen it. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the latest edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show, coming at you as I love to do every weekday. Over the airwaves of ESPN Radio, 250-plus markets across the United States of America, and, of course, the Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio, Sirius XM style, Channel 80 as well. The number to call up is 888-729-3776. That's 888-SAY-ESPN. It's time for some Straight Talk brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless, best phones, best networks, no contracts. 
You know, I cannot believe the idiots out here, and I'm not talking about my contemporaries in the media because we got to report what we have to report. So if you got the media out there and the New England Patriots swearing that Tom Brady has hurt his right hand, that Tom Brady walking around a little slinky may not be ready, or he's not going to be 100%, he's not going to be ready for the AFC Championship game to go up against the Jacksonville Jaguars and that vaunted defense. Anybody who believes that nonsense, I got some swamp land in East Rutherford, New Jersey to sell to you. I mean, can we really, really spare me? I can't believe that I am compelled to start off my radio show by bringing up something that I don't even consider news. Because I got news for you. It's very, very simple to me, ladies and gentlemen. If Tom Brady was really hurt, do you think Bill Belichick would ever let us know? Do you think Bill Belichick would ever let the Jacksonville Jaguars know? I mean, it's just such an utterly ridiculous storyline that a five-time champion who's been to seven Super Bowls, who's played through a myriad of nicks and knacks throughout his career, whose team obviously is in position for the seventh consecutive time. They are just 60 minutes away from a Super Bowl appearance. And I'm supposed to be worried that Tom Brady might have hurt his pinky. Really? Really? I mean, come on now. I don't have time for this nonsense. I'm obligated to report it. It is the ESPN. It is the worldwide leader. This is the news that is circulating. And I guess we have to discuss it. See, this is the reason why I po- why I have suddenly politicked for knowing I will never get to be a commentator on Monday Night Football. This is the reason. Because, because see, I'm the type of person. I'd be the Jeff Van Gundy of Monday Night Football. I'd be going off like, please, why are we wasting time? Why are we wasting time with this non-story? I could be in a book. I could see myself in a booth now with another color commentator and a play-by-play guy. Can we move on? Are we really supposed to take this seriously? That Tom Brady has hurt himself. He's hurt his hand. Oh, my Lord. Tom Brady's not going to be able to go. Oh, stop it. It's a waste of time. Now, me personally, I would I, I would prefer to elevate myself and be gifted enough where I would warrant comparisons to the late great Howard Cosell, God rest his soul. But I ain't that damn lucky. And I digress from the bigger point. The bigger point is there's no story here. Tom Brady will be ready Sunday. The Jacksonville Jaguars, even with their elite defense, courtesy of Jalen Ramsey talking smack, uh, their defense in Jacksonville might be in a little bit of trouble. Unless you're one of those people that believe what Max Kellerman believes, that, you know, Tom Coughlin, formerly of the New York Giants, now a VP with the Jacksonville Jaguars, will have this team ready, even though he ain't the damn coach. Believe what you want. Believe what you want. I would remind everybody that the Jacksonville Jaguars, with the vaunted number two overall defense, did surrender 35 points to the Pittsburgh Steelers last Sunday. I remind everybody about that. I know they scored 45. Or the Pittsburgh Steelers scored 42, rather. But 35 points legitimately were surrendered by Jacksonville's defense. I'd like to remind everybody of that reality, just in case you forgot. To make sure we get that out of the way. It's very, very important. Number to call up, as always, is 888-729-3776. That's 888-SAY-ESPN. Plus, you can catch me on my Twitter handle, at Stephen A. Stephen A. Smith, rather. And, of course, on Facebook, it's Stephen A. as well. This is the one thing. You know, we talk about this, and we talk about Tom Brady and the New England Patriots. We need to talk about who's gone. We need to talk about the Pittsburgh Steelers, too. Because, see, news is circulating and percolating in the streets of New York City, in case y'all missed it. Todd Haley, the former offensive coordinator for the Pittsburgh Steelers, essentially unceremoniously dismissed yesterday by Mike Tomlin, is on the market. And because the Steelers had a top three offense, And I believe that Todd Haley, with all due respect, has been railroaded by Big Ben Roethlisberger because if the quarterback wanted him to stay, Todd Haley would still be there as the offensive coordinator. Let's call it what it is. The quarterback coach is going to be elevated to the offensive coordinator, Mr. Randy Fickner. He is a guy that gets along very, very well with Big Ben Roethlisberger. I'm sick and tired of hearing these damn stories. I'm sick and tired of these stories where there's some offensive coordinator that gets so gets along so well with the quarterback, and as a result, They get elevated. 
Somebody gets elevated from a coordinator to a head coaching position or from a positional coach to a coordinator's position because they have great relationships. Damn the relationships. Do you produce? Todd Haley produced. If you're going to let him go, let him go. But I don't think all of these stories are fair to him where we're hearing about his relationship or lack thereof and how you wish that he had a better relationship with Big Ben Roethlisberger. Big Ben Roethlisberger got sacked less over the last three years than ever before. Big Roth, Ben Roethlisberger was prolific over the last few years than he ever was before. Antonio Brown had five consecutive 100 reception seasons under Todd Haley. The offense was ranked in the top three to five over the last four years. Now, I'm not trying to paint the man as a saint or anything like that. You give me a choice between him and Tomlin, I'm picking Tomlin all day, every day. Let's not, let's not, let's not lose perspective. But, Todd Haley doesn't deserve to be excoriated like he was some bum that got in the way of the Steelers' success. By and large, he contributed to their success. And right now, percolating throughout the streets of New York City to the point where my idiotic producers, who I love daily, but damn it, they are idiotic. His name is Jonathan Winthrop, to be specific. This dude is talking about how Todd Haley is a good choice to be the head coach. Let's pump the brakes on that. Because here's the reality. Todd Haley knows football. Todd Haley can be an offensive coordinator. Todd Haley is not a leader of men. That's where your problem lies. There is a difference between doing your job and being an overseer of men. There's a difference, especially in the NFL. And when it comes to the NFL, let's understand something incredibly, incredibly important. You cannot have somebody That's a bit eccentric. That can be cantankerous, even belligerent to some degree. You cannot have him as the head coach of New York City. He'll get eaten alive. He'll get eaten alive. You leaving notes on napkins at bars. You depart from bars with your pelvic jammed up because you, yeah, because you might have slipped on stairs or got beat up because you were a little inebriated, depending on what stories you believe. You cannot have an offensive coordinator. With a suspect background in terms of his relationships, or dare I say his behavior, being a head coach in New York City, it's a disaster waiting to happen. You got to be disciplined. You cannot go that route if you are New York. People are talking about that with the Giants and the Jets or whatever. Todd Bowles is coaching New York Jets. Should, should he consider Todd Haley as an offensive coordinator? Sure, I don't mind. But last time I checked, Todd Haley needs something to work with. And Josh McCown ain't no damn Big Ben Roethlisberger. And Anderson and Severin Jenkins and all of these boys, you know, they ain't Antonio Brown. There's no Le'Veon Bell on this roster. Last time I checked, it was the likes of Matt Forte. No disrespect. So let's pump the brakes. And let's keep things in its proper perspective. Let's understand what this is. Todd Haley didn't deserve to be unceremoniously dismissed. Dismiss him, sure, but we don't need to be talking about him like he didn't do the job, because he did. That's number one. Number two, you want him in New York as an offensive coordinator? I'm all for that. Don't talk to me about him as a head coach. I want to hear it. And number three, can we start with the bogus stories about Tom Brady being injured? If he were truly injured, Bill Belichick would lie about that. And you damn well know it. Don't let me sick my man Carlton and tamp on you. Don't let me do that. Bill Belichick would never tell the truth about that. Let's be very, very clear with that. 888-729-3776. 888-SAY-ESPN. By the way, I don't need to wait till Friday. I'm picking the New England Patriots to come out of the AFC. I'm picking the Philadelphia Eagles to beat the Vikings in the NFC Championship game Sunday night. And we can spend the next two days talking about just that. Live right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show. That was Straight Talk Wireless Nationwide Coverage on America's largest and most dependable 4G LTE networks. You are listening live to the Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio. Back with more and then some in a minute. Hello, I'd like to deposit this to checking. Fate is a fickle master. What? The future is uncertain. Okay, and what's my account balance? Ah, the horizon is cloudy. I see a long, treacherous voyage Um, filled with great peril. Look, can I just get a deposit slip or something? A fortune bank teller. Surprising. What's not surprising? 
how much you could save by switching to Geico. I see a yellow-eyed serpent what? and a low APR. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Welcome back to Stephen A. Smith Show right here on ESPN Radio. Coming at you as I love to do every weekday over the airwaves of ESPN Radio. Sirius XM, Channel 80, 250 plus markets across the United States of America. Check your local listings. And I'm quite sure you will find me. The number to call up as always is 888-729-3776. That's 888-SAY-ESPN. See, one of the reasons, it's just like people, look, I'm a native New Yorker. You know, I'm a transplant to L.A. too because I'm in L.A. a lot because I love the sunshine, the weather, the palm trees. Well, damn it, let me stop lying. I just love the scenery. It's La La, okay? You don't see me looking to get to San Francisco, all right? Even though there's nice folks out there, but L.A. is just uh, special. Let's just leave it at that. But I will tell you this. The interesting thing about just thinking about things, I'm from New York, and y'all got me praising Tom Brady. This is not what I enjoy doing. He plays for that other team. Foxborough, Massachusetts, Boston, Massachusetts is what he represents. I'm a New Yorker. I don't enjoy praising him, but I must be honest. 66,000 yards passing in his career. 66,000. 488 touchdowns, just 160 interceptions. A a career quarterback rating of 97.6. This year, at age 40, 4,577 yards passing, 32 touchdowns, eight interceptions, a, a 13 and three record. A candidate for league MVP on this. And oh, by the way, the man is 196 and 55 as a starting quarterback. And y'all are talking to me about Tom Brady? I mean, look, what do you want me to say? Tom Brady is sensational. Can we stop acting like we don't know? Can we stop acting like we don't know? He's that gifted. He's that gifted. And and by the way, do y'all realize that with the exception of his injury in 2008 in the first game of the season, for the 2008 season, do y'all realize that the only game the only games that Tom Brady has missed throughout his entire career since 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 2002 is the four game suspension he's received last year for the Flake game. The man doesn't miss games. He doesn't miss games. And y'all are telling me he hurt his hand handing the ball off to one of those runners in practice that Tom Brady's going to miss the AFC Championship game? Or Tom Brady's in danger? Stop. Stop wasting my time. Y'all are almost wasting my time as much as these damn referees in the NBA are wasting my time. And I'll get to them in just a little while. Don't you worry about that. 888-729-3776 is 888-SAY-ESPN. Let's go to the phones. Brian and Callie, you're live with Stephen A. Talk to me. How's it going, Stephen A.? Thanks for taking my call. All right, go ahead, man. You're absolutely right, man. It's pretty bogus on this injury to Tom Brady's hand, but I'm just curious to what you think. Do you think it's some type of angle that they're trying to take or trying to trying to make? I mean, <clears throat> well, listen, against Jacksonville's defense and the way everybody's talking about it, um, listen, the bottom line is you just never know. It's entirely plausible. Bill Belichick will use every trick in the book. Teddy Bruschi came on my show first take on ESPN2 every weekday morning, 10 a.m. Eastern at 12 noon. Teddy Bruschi, a three-time champion with the New England Patriots, came on the show and said, when he played for Bill Belichick, Bill Belichick told the players all the time, make sure to spray the perfume. Spray the perfume. You know, just flood the opponents with compliments. Don't give them any bulletin board material whatsoever. Let them do that. You make sure you don't. Just be ready to play come Sunday. And look at what has happened. Look at how that's worked out for everybody that has played for Bill Belichick in New England. Right. One one more thing, one more thing. I really don't have faith in Blake Bortles because, you know, he's not really shown up to be the quarterback that everybody thought he was going to be. He did be, last but. week, though. He did last week. He did last week. Let's be honest and, and let's be honest and fair and give credit where it's due. 
And by the way, my producer is telling me that Brady missed the whole season uh, with the exception of game one in 2008. Evidently, my own producer is not listening to me because I do believe I said that before I said he missed the four games last year. I said with the exception, Cat Pass to my other producer, tell the truth. I said with the exception of the one game he played where he got injured in 2008, forcing him to miss the whole season. He's never missed a game other than the Flake Gate since 2002. But my other producer apparently didn't hear that part. Jonathan Winthrop, you need to listen. Go ahead. Go ahead, Brian. Go ahead. There's no, yeah, there's absolutely no, no way he's missing the AFC championship game. He's not going to miss it and he's not going to underperform. He's not going to underperform. Max Kellerman actually came on my, sh- on, on first date today and this man sat up there and said with a straight face that Brady has more to prove than Blake Bortles, Nick Foles, or Case Keenum. Because the New England got, New England Patriots got rid of Garoppolo and you're basically saying Brady's the man. So Brady's got to show up and produce. I'm like, please, please spare me. Not trying to hear that at all. Not trying to hear it at all. Appreciate the call, Brian. Thank you so much. I got distracted by the television for a second because apparently Scandal debuts tonight. The final season, I forgot. Olivia Pope, a.k.a. Kerry Washington. I totally, totally forgot that the, the, the season, I thought the season debut was next week. It's tonight. I ain't missing Scandal tonight on ABC. Make sure y'all don't miss it either. Back to the calls. Omar, Connecticut, July live with Stephen A. What's up? What's going on, Stephen A.? I'm all right. Go ahead, man. Hey, uh, don't you think the Tom Brady... Injury is uh, more news than a lot of balls than whatever's coming out of his mouth. Um, you sound a bit muffled. I need you to turn away from, step away from the mic a little bit, so I can hear you clearly. Because I didn't understand your point. Don't you think that Tom Brady's injury is more news than whatever is coming out of Lavar Ball's mouth? Well, Tom, you, uh, yeah, right now, sure. Why? Because I think Lavar Ball has never said anything that is true. Everything he says is a lie. Well, so what does that have to do with anything? We just thought Tom Brady, we just found out that he may have been injured 24 hours ago. What does that have to do with LeVar Ball? Because you're saying Tom Brady's injury is not a, it's not a news. You shouldn't be covering it. Well, what I'm saying to you is that I think it's a lie. I think that in other words, they're trying to sit up there and hoodwink folks and hopefully the Jacksonville Jaguars end up believing that Tom Brady is considerably less than 100% so they can underestimate, they can underestimate New England and, and slip up and New England could take advantage of it from an opposition perspective. That's all I meant. So what, what's the difference between what LeVar Ball is doing? Well, LeVar Ball doesn't have to play. Tom Brady does. That would be the difference. I know you tried to be smart and slick. But you ain't on this level. You can't catch me off guard with that. Have a nice day. What do you mean what LeVar Ball has to do with that? LeVar Ball can talk all the, all the junk he wants. Lonzo Ball has to cash those checks. And in Lithuania, LiAngelo and LaMelo have to cash those checks. New England can say what they want about Tom Brady, but Tom Brady will be out on the field to show us. That is the difference. Evidently, the brother in Connecticut couldn't understand that. 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. More of your calls on Brady on the AFC and the NFC Championship game coming up this weekend. Plus, I'll transition to the NBA and tell you why the NBA referees are hurting the National Basketball Association. I'll explain in a minute. You're listening live to Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! Ladies and gentlemen, let me deviate away from what I was talking about as it pertains to Tom Brady, Todd Haley, AFC, NFC Championship game, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll get into the NBA referees and how I think they're damaging the sport in a minute. But I had to deviate away for, uh, you know, because of a serious issue. I wanted to bring this up. Because it's necessary. And in all fairness to one of my producers, my board op that was playing the song, you know, living in America, uh, James Brown, you know, it's fun listening to him. One of the greatest singers ever. It was fun listening to that song before uh, uh, when Apollo Creed was entering the ring in Rocky Four before uh, uh, Drago destroyed him and killed him in a movie, of course. But on a serious level, no laughing matter. The song is appropriate because living in America makes you think only in America and only in America could this happen. Could this even 
think, I mean, the thought of this could even happen. We have a serial sex abuser and a gymnastics coach, former gymnastics coach at Michigan State University. His name is Larry Nasser. This is an individual that is so heinous. He's already been sentenced to 60 years in jail in, uh, regarding charges pertaining to child pornography. But come to find out, he's abused several gymnasts and others, and prosecutors are asking for anywhere from an additional 40 to 125 years of prison time. In other words, this man is going to spend the rest of his natural life in, in behind bars. He ain't getting out. <laughs> Listen to this story that was just published by CNN. Serial sexual abuser Larry Nasser accused the judge presiding over his case of conducting a four-day sentencing media circus for her own benefit, according to a letter read aloud in court Thursday. Quote, she wants me to sit in the witness box next to her for all four days so the media cameras will be directed toward her, Nasser wrote in the letter, according to the reading by Judge Rosemary Aquilina. After reading parts of the letter, the judge defended her role in conducting the victim impact statements. NASA, the former renowned doctor for USA Gymnastics, pleaded guilty to seven counts of criminal sexual conduct in Ingham County in Michigan. As part of his sentencing, about 100 victims in all are expected to speak in court about his abuse and the impact it has had on their lives. As of Thursday morning, just over 50 victims had spoken already, often in personal and powerful terms. NASA told Aquilina that the letter was cathartic and was written prior to appearing in court. When I wrote that, it was before I came here, okay? It was a stress, as it says at the end. It was like a cathartic. You know what I mean? It was just a, it was meant for a cry for community mental health. That's what Larry Nasser is saying. In a letter, he said he was worried about his own mental state and his ability to handle the continued victim impact. Quote, I'm very concerned about my ability to be able to face witnesses this next four days mentally, he wrote. He also wrote that he passed out twice in the morning of his of his federal sentencing. Aquilina said, if I pass out, she'll have the EMTs revive me and then prop me up in the witness box, Nasser wrote, according to Aquilina. The judge said Nasser's letter was mumbo jumbo and delusional. This isn't worth the paper it's written on. There's no truth in here. It's delusional, she said. You need to talk about these issues with a therapist. Contrary to CNN's headline, I'm not a therapist, she said, referring to an article describing her empathetic demeanor toward the victims as they gave their statements. Ladies and gentlemen, a man that was a sexual predator that sexually molested children and others and the victims span more than a hundred is saying that he should not have to be subjected to sitting in court and listening to their stories over four days. It's a mental health issue for him. Ladies and gentlemen, only in America that dude deserves to be under. I know this is ESPN is a Walt Disney network, but I got to say it at least once he needs to be thrown under the jail with the damn sodomites. That's right. I said it. He needs to be subjected to what he subjected people to at least 100 times over. I don't even think the devil would have sympathy for him. That's how bad and despicable of a human being this man is. He deserves what he gets. Matter of fact, I'd stretch it out to an additional four days just because I got the letter. That's what I'd do. Man's a despicable, disgusting human being. He has spent the rest of the natural life in jail, and I hope it lasts a very, very long time. Death is too easy for him. Too easy. 888-729-3776. 888-SAY-ESPN. Your calls in more in a minute. You're listening live to Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! 46 minutes past hour number one back here on the Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio. Get the feeling of being rewarded with gold status at Shell with the Fuel Rewards program. Download the Fuel Rewards app, join and start saving five cents a gallon today. Number to call up as always is 888-729-3776. It's 888-SAY-ESPN. Before I get back to the calls, 
let me say this about something that's really, really on my mind, and I'm really bothered about it in all seriousness. I was watching, uh, torturing myself, watching my favorite basketball team, the New York Knicks, use, lose yet another game last night. One of the things that really irked my nerves to no end was watching referee, a referee I respect, uh, who's done an outstanding job throughout his career as an NBA official. His name is Derek Stafford. And he issued a technical foul to Courtney Lee of the New York Knicks. Now, Courtney Lee of the New York Knicks, please understand something here. He's arguing with a player, okay? That's what he's doing. He's arguing with a player. And this is a guy that, um, you know, I'm just looking at him. This rookie out of Oregon from last, his name is Dylan, I believe. Um, he's arguing with the kid. The kid grabs, not nothing flagrant, nothing demonstrative, but the kid, you know, grabs his arm. He flails him off. The kid, the kid rips on the back of his jersey. He nudges him during a jump ball. The referee stops. The two are talking to each other, and he gives Courtney Lee a technical foul. Courtney Lee is like, what did I do? What did I do? And Derek Safford ultimately issues a statement talking about inappropriate language. Really? Now, you got to understand something, ladies and gentlemen. I have no problem with an official that wants to tee you up because you're speaking very demonstrably and disrespectfully so towards the official. I have no problem with an official who's warning guys excessively because he's fearful that a fight might break out and he wants to reel that in, take control of the game. We understand that. We truly, truly do. The Joey Crawfords of the world and and, and, and others throughout NBA history, we, we get it. We understand. But we are living in a day and age right now where LeBron James, the greatest player in the world, clearly box office, has been ejected. Steph Curry, the greatest shooter in the world, a two-time league MVP and a two-time champion, has been ejected for a game. Russell Westbrook, arguably the most exciting player in the NBA, a superstar, the greatest athletic point guard we've ever seen, is getting ejected. Kevin Durant, one of the top two players on the planet Earth, as far as I'm concerned, is getting ejected. And nobody's thinking anything about it. And then when the Clippers and the Houston Rockets get into it at the Staples Center the other day, and that follows up by Aaron Aflalo swinging on an Orlando Magic the other day, we want to talk about image issues. Has anybody taken into consideration that the NBA officials may be culprits in all of this? Because maybe if you weren't so eager and willing to give out texts like they're a bag of Skittles, and you're throwing dudes out of the game that people pay their hard-earned money to come and see, maybe the NBA wouldn't be having questions about an image issue, which, by the way, I think is bogus. These guys do a tremendous job. The players, in terms of their community work, their social activism, etc., the NBA as a league has done a good job. The NBA officials do a highly credible job of officiating this game, even though they make mistakes from time to time. But my God, you're just going to throw guys out of the game or issue texts and think nobody notices? That gives Joe Public out there an excuse to label these, pra- these players as problems. How long do you think it's going to be before people start looking at the players and going like this? Well, you know, we really, really have to address this. I mean, my God, maybe Stephen A., they should be in anger management class. I mean, my Lord. Hockey players punching people in the face and hitting them with slapstick shots. Pucks flying everywhere. Crashing into the glass. Baseball players, clubhouses and dugouts are emptying. Brawls are taking place on a baseball field. We'll manage ourselves. A basketball player has bad breath. A football player takes a knee, and oh my God, Armageddon has arrived. 
Don't get me started on that. But my real overlying point, as it pertains specifically to NBA officials, is you don't recognize that we living in a different day and age? You don't recognize the fact that when you are so willing to give out texts and eject people from game, that contributes, that contributes to the league's reputation being sullied? You don't get that? You don't understand that? The NBA officials are just as responsible as the players and the coaches and the league office to uphold and help build the brand that is the NBA. You got a meeting coming up in Los Angeles with Michelle Roberts, the executive director of the NBA Players Association, with Chris Paul, the president of the association. And I don't give a damn about me getting on Chris Paul the other day about his leadership role and that stuff that took place in L.A. at the Staples Center. That's one incident. That doesn't take away from the character that this man has and how good of a person he is and how consummate of a professional he is and how great of a player he is. And Michelle Roberts is a good woman. So the NBA referees that want to sit down and talk to her and Chris Paul, God bless you. But you can't look at them and put it on the players to uphold the league and absolve yourself from responsibility and culpability in that regard. You have just as much of a responsibility to uphold the league. You ain't separate and apart from the league. If you are an official, you have an obligation, just like the players, to conduct yourself accordingly. What about when this guy, Kurt, Courtney Kirkland, was button heads with Sean Livingston. I watched that. Sean Livingston didn't instigate that headbutt scenario. That was Kirkland who did that. You're an official for Christ's sakes. And as far as I'm concerned, nobody has said this, so I'm going to say this. These NBA officials are starting to get like the Major League Baseball officials, where you instigating and antagonizing players. It ain't right. We don't pay to see y'all. And I'm not saying they're always wrong because that's irresponsible and false. What I'm saying is you don't have to be as excessive as you've been sometimes and so eager to give out texts and throw people out of games. It ain't right. And it contributes to the negative publicity that the league gets with its players. And it ain't right. You got an obligation to uphold the standard too. Somebody need to say it. So damn it, I did. NBA officials do not get a pass on this. Hour number two up next. That's just a sample of what. Show right here on ESPN Radio, everybody. Here with you over the next hour, as I am every weekday. Number to call up, as always, is 888-729-3776. 888-SAY-ESPN. ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive's Home Insurance. Get your quote at Progressive.com. Today, approximately 15 minutes or so, we'll have boxing analyst extraordinaire for ESPN, the one and only Teddy Atlas. And thereafter, at approximately 30 minutes past the hour, I will have the IBF welterweight champion of the world, Errol Spence Jr., uh, who will be fighting Lamont Peterson uh, this Saturday in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, make sure you don't miss it for the welterweight crown. I think he'll win that fight. I'll leave it at that. Looking forward to talking to Errol Spence. He's one of the superstars, you know, coming up in this sport. Is he Floyd Mayweather? Not yet. Uh, but he has that potential. Uh, Tyrone Crawford's coming. Keith Thurman's already there as the, the WBA, um, WBC champion. So. We'll definitely talk about that as the show progresses today. 888-729-3776. It's 888-SAY-ESPN. But until then, we'll go back to the calls since I haven't had much time to take calls in the first hour. Let's go to my man Carlton in Tampa. You're live with Stephen A. Talk to me, buddy. How are you? Hey, I'm good. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you for calling. What's up? I want to talk referees, but I want to talk NFL referees. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the crew for, uh, the, uh, New England game was named, uh, for, for, for Sunday's New England game. And it's okay. Cleet Blakeman. Cleet Blakeman has refed, been the head ref of six New England games. New England is two and four 
when he's been on the field. So I think the NFL is hearing, uh, you know, the pressure of how the calls have gone three to one against the Patriots opponents the last four games. And they're trying to assign somebody, somebody who might have an objective bone in their body to hit up that ref- referee group. But Tony Sterator is the back judge. He's uh, He's got old Gene Steratore's older brother. And so i got to do some research on, on past interference calls that he's called this year because he's going to be the guy throwing oh the flag. Oh, Lord. You're, you're, as I you're said, doing your research the, to set the stage the so when New England wins another game, another AFC Championship game, you're going to point out how it's Bill Belichick. He won't stop. He won't stop cheating. That's where the, you're going, Carlton. The Jacksonville Jaguars were not called called for a single defensive holding or pass interference call against the Steelers, even though Bouye and and uh, Ramsey were mugging the Steelers receivers. And I predict, I predict, Steve A, they'll be called for at least three defensive holding or pass interference calls by Mr. Starator there. We shall see. I like the idea that Cleve ba- Blakeman is the, is the head ref, because he certainly hasn't been a, a Patriots favorite there, you know, given that they've probably lost more when he's been the head ref than anybody else. One more point, Stephen A. Go ahead. The, the reason why Haley is gone, okay? The Steelers' two most important games this year, the game against the Patriots and, of course, the Jacksonville. Yeah, we know, that, we know that they, botch call at the end. No question about that. Oh, they completely botched the end of the Patriots uh, game, especially that two-yard pass when they had 28 seconds to go and he tackled inbounds. And, of course, that led to the disastrous interception one play later. And, and of course... Uh, Haley had had, what, six or seven minutes while they were reviewing the Jesse James call to get his offense aligned, what they were going to do on the next three plays, and he botched it. And then the two fourth down low percentage calls that they got stuck both times in, in the playoff game. Somebody had to pay for that. Now I'm just wondering, when the heck is somebody on the defensive side going to pay for their wretched secondary? Because well, that's the next person. Well, that I, needs I, to, I don't think there's any question. Go. I don't think there's any question about that, but I also don't think it was because of this play, a couple of botch plays this season. The fact is, Todd Haley had been here for six years. He walked into this season in the last year of his contract, and there was speculation long before those mistakes were made that the Steelers were going to make a change. And I think it had a lot to do with his relationship, particularly with Big Ben, and obviously – uh, you listen, this is why Fichtner, Fich, Fich, Fichtner, you know, has developed and cultivated a relationship with Big Ben to the point where they're going to take him from the quarterback coaching position and put him in as the offensive coordinator, primarily due to his great relationship with Big Ben. But you know what? Dirk Cutter had a great relationship with Jameis Winston to the point where they booted Lovey Smith out the door in Tampa, and look where that got them. Yeah. Well, you know, Roethlisberger, I, I don't know if it was Roethlisberger pointed it out or the columnist that pointed it out, that he, he has been successful on 18 out of 19 one-yard quarterback sneaks in his life. Right. And he's saying, I don't know why we're not calling that That's darn right. thing. So obviously he had a problem with these darn play calls. Not only that, but at the end of the Patriots game. So somebody was going to have to pay for that. Because it doesn't matter if you have the best offense in the NFL, if at the critical moments in playoff games or the Super Bowl, you lose your mind like Pete Carroll did, not giving the ball to Marshawn Lynch three times from the half-yard line. You know, so it doesn't really matter. You destroy the entire season if you can't keep your head in those moments. I got you. And the the Steelers couldn't do it this year. Thanks a lot, buddy. I appreciate the call. All good points. No question about it. I agree with you on every single point that you made. No doubt. Let's go to Byron in Maine. You're live with Stephen A. Go ahead, Byron. Hi, Stephen A. Thanks for taking my call. Go ahead, buddy. (laughs) I want to change... uh, the pace a little bit. My my concern is not the officiating, but your opinion I would like to get on the LeBron James Michael Jordan comparison. You hear a lot of it all the time. What I would like to see done is the people that have the films of Michael playing through his years that are matching LeBron's age and his years right now. Um, it doesn't matter to I, me. It doesn't matter to me. LeBron James as a talent is a freak of nature 
and a once-in-a-lifetime player. 6'9", 260, can handle the ball, uh, can pass. His basketball IQ is off the charts. He's a physical specimen. He's reliable health-wise. All of those things are true. And I would still take Jordan any day of the week and twice on Sundays because LeBron did not did not have that killer instinct. He does not have a closers mentality. He will produce for you. He will put up numbers. He will he will keep you competitive. All those things are true. But when it's really time to close the deal, that is not the person that I'm going to rely upon. And when I think about Michael Jordan, I see a closer. I see the greatest assassin that the game has ever known. No, he's not 260 pounds. No, he can't beat you the way LeBron James could beat you, but he can will you to victory. And for example, even with the troubles and the issues that the Cleveland Cavaliers are having this year, we heard the same thing from LeBron in a, in a conference championship games. You know, after they beat Boston, he was talking about he was so stressed. He didn't even want to think about it. Why? Because of, oh, look at how tough the Golden State Warriors are going to be. You didn't hear that from Michael Jordan. That's why he was 6-0 in the NBA Finals. Yeah, LeBron's talent is not into question. It's his his mentality exactly during the games or at the end of games. Exactly. You never saw Michael. I never saw Michael not play with intensity. I can see games, even the last few, against Toronto that's just been played. I see LeBron being the last Cleveland Cavaliers down the floor, not on a fast break, but just walking with his hands completely at his side. Yeah, I see a guy that was talking yesterday basically preparing all of us for the Cleveland Cavaliers finishing the second place again. That's what I see in here when I'm looking at LeBron James right now, a team and a player that knows they can't beat the Golden State Warriors. You'd have never seen that from Michael Jordan. You'd have never seen it. Appreciate the call, man. Thank you. 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. The great one. Boxing analyst extraordinaire Teddy Atlas. He's up next with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. I'm a robot vacuum cleaner, so yeah, I got one gig. I suck up dirt, so pardon my inferiority complex about Geico, who does so much more. Like, not only could they save their customers money on car insurance, but they got fast and friendly claim service, too. And an award-winning mobile app. Plus access to licensed agents 24-7. Who am I kidding? I can't even do corners. Uh Uh-oh, choking hazard. (gasps) Popcorn girdles. Geico. Expect great savings and a whole lot more. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show. 16 minutes past hour number two back here on the Stephen A. Smith Show. ESPN Radio, 250 plus markets across the United States of America, as well as on Sirius XM Channel 80. Number to call up as always is 888-729-3776. That's 888-SAY-ESPN. No matter what the weather is outside, you can always brighten the day with 1-800-Flowers.com. When you order a dozen multicolored roses for only twenty nine ninety nine, you'll get another dozen absolutely free. Just go to 1-800-Flowers.com slash ESPN. It is always my honor and privilege to have my next guest. On the line with me, I love doing Sports Center with him, particularly post fight when he has to school me and remind me that I'm trying to be slick with my college educated self. I love it. I'm talking about the great Teddy Atlas. He's on the line with yours truly right now. What's up, buddy? How you doing, man? Hey, Stephen. How are you? I'm doing great. It's always good to talk to you. Talk to me about this fight coming up Saturday night. Errol Spence Jr. against uh, L- Lamont Peterson on Showtime. Your thoughts about that? I mean, for me, Spence is a monster. He's a beast. My son works for the Oakland Raiders, and he uses uh, that kind of verbiage over there in the NFL. They, okay. When they want to compliment somebody, the guy's a beast. Mm. And for me, the best way I could compliment Spence, usually I say things that are a little bit more complex sometimes, but um, it gets it gets right to the point. He's a beast. And a smart beast. See, when I train fighters, sometimes I say like to Timothy Bradley, I say, look, we're going to be a monster in this fight, but we're going to be a smart monster. He's a smart monster. He's technically solid. He was an Olympian. Uh, he fought the best in the world in the Olympics internationally, uh, so he knows he belongs at that level. He learned how to fight. He's a southpaw on top of it. He's physically so strong. I don't know how he makes welterweight. He's a big, strong guy. But most importantly, he's got that attitude. He's got attitude that I'm going to get you. 
You know, I'm going to get you, and you are not going to stop me. I remember years ago, Customato, my mentor used to tell me, very few people get supreme confidence. Very few. The only two he ever saw that he thought had it was Muhammad Ali, Sugar Ray Robinson. And I, I think that I've seen certain guys that come very close to that supreme confidence. And Spence might be one of those guys that really means in supreme confidence that I don't think you can lose. I don't think I can lose. I don't think there's any way that I will not find a way, no matter what it takes, to win this fight. And having said that, he's fighting a guy in Peterson who's a solid guy. He's a solid guy. His M.O. is a little similar to Spence. You know, he likes to go after you. He likes to press the action. He likes to go downstairs, you know, to the basement. But the only difference is he's doing it with a guy who does all those things much, much better at a much higher level. Spence goes downstairs to the body. That That's his forte. That You know, that's what he all loves right. to do. But he doesn't just go downstairs. He takes over the whole floor. I mean, so at the end of the day, I see Spence, even with a solid, Peterson in front of him, I see Spence getting him out of there. Well, let me ask you this, Teddy. Has he really, uh, Errol Spence Jr., I love him. He's my favorite right now, him and Terrence Crawford. But I got to ask you, has he really been tested? Because even though he beat Kell Brook, that was after Kell Brook got softened up, particularly his eye socket, against Triple G. He fought Triple G before he fought Errol Spence Jr. I thought if he had, had he fought Errol Spence Jr. before the Triple G fight, had he, had had Kell Brook never had the Triple G fight, then I think Errol Spence Jr. might have had a toughest a tougher matchup against him. What do you say to that? There's my college friend with that college <laughs> wit. There he is. Yeah, of course you're going to come with the right question. Look, has he been completely, completely tested? In my eyes, very close. If if not completely, very close. Not just in a Brook fight, which you're right, he got damaged. He got softened up against Golovkin, no doubt about it. But he was he's still a big welterweight. He's a solid welterweight. Before that, he was undefeated. He was fighting in his home country. You fight in your home country. You have a lot more going for you. You have a whole country you don't want to let down. That is not an easy task for anybody. But there's a guy with 200, 250 amateur fights. He fought the best in the world. He fought some of these guys that are world champions now when they were amateurs. You still beating really good fighters, even though they're only three-round fights. So in that way, I believe what I see. I believe what I'm getting and spent. I believe he's everything that I said the first five minutes of this interview. And I believe that he is in the most talented weight class there is, the most competitive talented in boxing right now, the welterweight class. I mean, that welterweight class is no joke. I mean, you got guys like Thurman, you got you got Danny Garcia, you got Crawford, who you just said. Yep. I mean, you you have a weight class there that is so, so full. I, I know there's somebody I'm missing right now. You got Thurman, you got Spence. Yeah, yeah, Sean you got, Porter. Sean Porter's tough. You he's got tough. Sean Porter. Porter he's, He's a little bit below those guys, yeah, but, but he's, tough. He's, a, he's a tough guy. He's a load. He's a guy that brings it all the time. Well, and and in Thurman, I mean, you might have the best athlete in boxing. Well, I mean, well, stay he's right a there. really athletic stay, guy who stay can right go there. inside and outside. Ted, Teddy, stay right there with Keith Thurman. We're talking to the great Teddy Atlas, box, boxing analyst extraordinaire, right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. I spoke to Errol Spence on First Take yesterday. He's about to come on his radio show after I hang up with you. This man sets up there and he says... Keith Thurman, he thinks Keith Thurman is trying to duck him. That's who he really, really wants. Is that just hyperbole? Is that just talking because you're trying to coax him into the big money fight? Or do you believe that Keith Thurman may be avoiding Errol Spence Jr.? See, that's a good question. I think that Thurman is a smart guy. If you're going to be a champion, you're going to be a guy that that Stephen A. and Teddy Allen is going to spend time talking about. You know what? you got to be more than just that beast. Like I said before, you got to be a smart monster. He's a smart guy. He's not going to take that fight now until it's big enough, until the money's there, until everything else is out of the way, and that's the last option, and it's the right option. 
Of course. So in that way, if, does that answer your question? Does that mean he's dunking him? Yeah, maybe he is dunking him. Does that mean he's afraid of him? No, not in well, that way. It just means that it does not make any sense for Keith Thurman right but, now, undefeated Keith Thurman right now, to be fighting a guy like Spence. Well, let me tell you why I think it makes sense to me, Teddy. Keith Thurman has already fought Danny Garcia. He's already fought Sean Porter. So what I'm saying is, who else is left out there for Keith Thurman to fight? That's the way I'm looking at it. Yeah, you know what? In his mind, as good as these guys are, they can still, it's kind of like as good as that steak is, they could still use a couple minutes on a barbecue, on a stove. They could just use a couple more minutes. And that's how he's thinking of it. He's thinking, you know, Spence is terrific. I know how good he is. I know what I have to deal with. But let him get a little bigger. Let him win this fight. Let him win another fight. Let him get a little bit bigger. And then also... He's coming off shoulder surgery. Let me, and that being Thurman, obviously, let me get another fight. Let me make another payday, and let's put this down the road a little bit, a little bit. Teddy Atlas right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. One of my last questions coming up. Terrence Crawford obviously is considered one of the best pound for pound fighters, if not the best pound for pound fighter in the world, even though some people would say Lomachenko is that dude. But you look at Terrence Crawford, he's absolutely sensational. He has decided to move up from the junior welterweight division to this division with Errol Spence Jr. He's going to fight Joe Horn. Everybody's expecting him to beat the Australian. And then after that, he sat up there and told me, Keith Thurman, Errol Spence Jr., Either one of them is fine with him. How do you believe Terrence Crawford is going to do on the elevated level of going up seven pounds to the welterweight division? And how soon do you think he'll end up fighting Thurman or Errol Spence Jr.? Well, yes, yeah, it's the right way because it's it's attached to weight. You know, the only the only way that he doesn't have his way at the next division the way he did at the last division because he is that good. There's no doubt about it. The, his skill sets are there and his mind is there. You know, he's a guy who's reliable, he's consistent, he's mentally tough, he's been tested. So the only way that he doesn't get to that place and dominate the welterweights the way he did below that is size. Is if these guys, because they're really good and they're bigger. You know, that, that would be a hell of a fight to see Crawford on the outside trying to keep Spence from coming in, trying to see him, keep him from eating up real estate and eating him up next, right after that real estate, being able to counter punch him, nail him big shots because he's a big puncher, being able to do all of that before he gets close to him. That would be a hell of a fight. Matter of fact, I know your main sport, I mean, you're good at everything, but your main sport is the NBA. For me, comparing Crawford and Spence that's kind of like going and comparing LeBron James and Kevin Durant. It really is, because LeBron James would, of course, be spent. Physical, a physical monster, and obviously he has the skill set. Kevin Durant, longer, taller, faster, more slick. That's what you would be getting. You would be getting LeBron James, and you would be getting Kevin Durant. Who's better one-on-one? Teddy Atlas, I got to put you on the spot here, sir. Because based on your synopsis, based on based on your breakdown, you seem to believe that Errol Spence Jr. and Terrence Crawford are on an elevated level over Keith Thurman. Am I reading that correctly? No, it's just the inactivity. I mean, I I really like Thurman. I think he's the probably the most athletic guy. Pure athletic guy, inside, outside, legs. He could do all those things. These guys could do one thing or the other, but not as well, not and not quite as versatile as, as Keith Thurman. I think he's the most athletic guy there is right now. The only thing about him, I mentioned it earlier, he's really smart. I mean, all these guys are smart in different ways, but he's really smart. I wonder how much he's dedicated to staying in this sport. That's the only thing that hits me a little bit when I look at him is how that he's made money already, you know, in a, in a short period of time. He's accomplished a lot in a short period of time. He's got a lot in front of him if he wants to. But how dedicated to the grind of the sport, to really, really the legacy, being the best in boxing, going through all the blood, sweat, and tears that's still in front of him, all the pain that's still in front of him. How dedicated is he really to that? I'm not positive. I'll close it by saying this. I think Errol Spence would beat Keith Thurman. And I think Terrence Crawford, my only reservation about him is whether or not he'd be too small. But skill-wise, I think he's better than Thurman. I like Thurman a lot, but I don't think he's these two. Thanks a lot, Teddy. I appreciate you, buddy, as always. Thanks so much. 
My pleasure, Stephen. All right. The one and only Teddy Atlas right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio, 888-729-3776. That's 888-SAY-ESPN. That was the premier boxing analyst extraordinaire that he is, the one and only Teddy Atlas of ESPN. Up next is the welterweight, the IBF welterweight champion of the world who fights this Saturday night on Showtime Boxing. His name is Errol Spence Jr. He's a bad somebody. And he's up next with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show right here on ESPN Radio. Let me get right to it. Last May 27th in Sheffield, England, this man went to the hometown of Kell Brook and via an 11th round KO captured the IBF welterweight championship of the world. He is the IBF welterweight champion of the world. He is getting set to defend his crown this Saturday night at the Barclays Center in New York City, Brooklyn, New York, against Lamont Peterson, the one and only Errol Spence Jr. What's going on, man? How are you? Hey, not much, man. Just getting ready. All right, you're on this media tour, man, and you're doing a lot of interviews and what have you. I want to make sure you're careful because you don't need to be tired Saturday night. You're going to be ready, right? Oh, yeah, I'm definitely going to be ready. Um, I had some interviews to do this morning, but I um, canceled them. Well, I appreciate you know, it's time, it's, it's time to get focused. I feel you on that. Um, how? What, what are you expecting this fight Saturday night? What are you predicting? Um, I'm expecting Lamont Peterson to come and shave like he always does and, um, you know, try to bring the fight to me. And, um, you know, I'm predicting, a, you know, one-sided, you know, great performance by myself in a W, of course. When you think about your skill set and what you bring to the table, you're 22 and 0. You got 19 knockouts. When you look at yourself right now, some people ask you, do you compare yourself to Floyd Money Mayweather, who you've sparred against, worked out with? I assume, uh, but but I want to know what kind of fighter. When you look throughout the annals of boxing history, and you think about the great fighters that have fought in this sport, who do you model yourself after? Oh, um, I think I model myself after guys like you know Ray Leonard, uh, Terry Norris. Um, uh, Gerald McCollum, um, you know, Vernon Forrest, mm-hmm. you know, just to name a few. I like all of those names, but you said Terry Norris, and even though I like Terry Norris, Terry Norris, because he used to put people to sleep, I remember what, what Simon Brown to it, it, it did to him. <laughs> I mean, you, you didn't think, you didn't think I forgot about that one, did you? I mean, come on now, he had, he did have a questionable jaw, wouldn't just say, that is not you. Um, I mean, he had a question with drive, but he got knocked out by big power punches. I mean, he got knocked out by Julian Jackson, and yep. um, you didn't you didn't say what he did the second fight against Simon Brown. That's true, though. He beat Simon Brown by decision, gave him a boxing lesson, took him to school. I remember when he knocked out John the Beast Mugabe. Trust me, I know enough about Terry Norris. Make no mistake about it. But let me get back to you. We're talking to Errol Spence Jr. right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio because right now, when we see some of the great, great boxers in the game, the Triple G's, the Canelo Alvarez's, others, you know, pound for pound wise, where do you put yourself right now? Um. Right now, I think I'm in the top five. Um, you know, I'm definitely not with number one. There's still a lot. Um, I know that this year that I am, you know, one of the best time prime fighters out there right now. Now, everybody's looking at Lamont Peterson as essentially a tune-up. We got Terrence Crawford moving up to the welterweight division after dominating at the junior welterweight spot. We've got guys like Keith Thurman, Danny Garcia, Sean Porter, and others in the welterweight division. Who's on your hit list? Who do you really, really want badly? I mean, everybody's on my hit list. I mean, Lamont Peterson, he's not – I mean, I don't consider him as a tuna fighter at all. I mean, Lamont Peterson is a top-rated Westway. He's a guy that, you know, always comes to fight and always in tough, close fights. I mean, it's arguably he could – I mean, he won that fight against Danny Garcia. I mean, he asked people. So, I mean, he's a tough fighter, but I want to unify the belt, so – not looking past this fight. I want to get, you know, Keith Thurman in the ring and uh and get the fight a bill. Do you feel anybody out there is ducking you? Um, I mean it's a lot of fighters out there that I think that that's avoiding me. You know, I don't like to use the word ducking, you know, but they are they are fighters out there that's avoiding me. A lot of the top West Ways are avoiding me. Have you concerned yourself with the fact that in some people's eyes you looked so great? Why would anybody want to risk their careers by fighting you a bit too early? 
as a result of that, you may not get the fights that you're in search of. Have you concerned yourself with that at all? I mean, that may that may be the fans, the fans, um, you know, perspective. But I feel like as a fighter, you know, I mean, that's your mentality should be different from from a fan mentality or a spectator mentality. Mm-hmm. As a fighter, your your whole you know mentality should be like, I want to fight the best, I want to beat the best. Oh, this guy ha- has a belt, you know, I'm gonna try to take this belt from him. You know, recently when I spoke to when I spoke to Terrence Crawford, and we're talking to Errol Spence Jr., the IBF welterweight champion of the world, looking to unify the belts. He'd love uh, Keith Thurman, which is something that he told me just a few days ago. But somebody else on the come up is one of the greatest in the world himself right now, Terrence Crawford. He was just a junior welterweight. He's moving up those seven pounds. He's got to handle business against Joe Horn. But then he says he wants you or Keith Thurman. What do you say to that? Um. I like his mentality. That's what he's supposed to want. And, um, you know, it's something that we definitely make it happen, especially, you know, with the guys in the suit, you know, go and talk about it and uh, try to get that fight made. I mean, he's across he's across the street, and I'm on the other side of the street, so that's something the guys in the suits got to discuss, and, you know, that goes past us just wanting to fight. Real quickly, one of the things that I just finished talking to Teddy Atlas about, boxing analyst extraordinaire for ESPN, I just finished talking to him about this. He was talking about, you know, your skill set and what you bring to the table. He said you're a monster. You're a smart monster. You bring a lot to the table and what have you. And he thinks that you could do a lot, but he was he was expressing surprise at your ability to stay at the welterweight division. Is it tough for you to stay at 147, or is that something that comes relatively easy for you? Um, I wouldn't say it's easy. It just takes. It, it, it's a lot of discipline. I mean, it's a lot of discipline, and um, you know, basically staying on top of your your um, your diet and and your weight. I mean, I woke up today only a pound over, so um, mm-hmm. you know, I, I'm not gonna say I make it easy, but you know, I just stay disciplined and stay to my food regimen, and um, it is. It, it get, it is mentally taxing because you want to eat certain things and right. you know people around you might be eating something and you can't eat that. So mm-hmm. I mean it, it is it is hard mentally, but I mean as long as I say discipline, I can make this weight for at least four or five more years. Yeah, because I was getting ready to ask: Is that your way of saying that you know what two three big fights at the at this weight at the welterweight spot at one forty seven, and then after that you're going to move up to junior middleweight? Is that the vision that you have for the future, or all you focused on right now is handling your business in this division? Hello. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me now? Oh, uh, yeah, I hear you. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That's. I mean, that's something I would do. Um, okay. You know, if, if if something presented itself where I, you know I could fight for a title at one fifty four, mm-hmm. you know, I I'll do that. I mean, if it was um, it was a it, it's an interest to me, but um, it's not something that I'm rushing at all. I got you. I mean, it's a lot of guys at forty seven. It's still my dream to be on the street at one forty seven. So that's my main focus. Last question to you: What's your prediction for Saturday night? We want to hear a prediction. Oh, my prediction for Saturday night. Is me getting my hand raised and, uh, you know, great one-sided performance. Lamar Peterson going to put up a great fight, but I feel like you have the skills and the ability to negate anything that he does and, um, you know, put on a great show and a great performance for the fans. Errol Spence Jr., the reigning defending IBF welterweight champion of the world, going up against Lamont Peterson Saturday night at the Barclay Center in Brooklyn on Showtime. Don't miss it. Appreciate you, man. Appreciate your time. Good luck this Saturday night, and I'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Cowboys Nation. Oh Lord, you're a Cowboys fan. I forgot <laughs> you were from Dallas, Texas. Oh, you, you, you just I, I, and I got love for you, and that's what you're gonna do to me. <laughs> Mention the Cowboys on this show. Oh Lord, <laughs> and, and you know what? They they shouldn't even be represented with, by you. You know that, right? Because you're a winner. You're a winner. <laughs> you can't say that about hey. the Cowboys. Hey, we'll be back to our glory day soon, man. Are you ready for this analogy for me to give this to you before I let you go? Right, you are twenty. You are twenty two and zero. It's been twenty two <laughs> years since the Dallas Cowboys won the Super Bowl. <laughs> Take it easy, man. We'll be back. You're whatever. Right. You've been saying they say that since you were born. Yeah, we'll be back. <laughs> Goodbye, man. Errol Smith Jr., IBF welterweight champion of the world. He's a bad somebody, y'all. Make no mistake about it. Lamont Peterson. Good luck, my brother. Good luck. You will need it. Your calls to close out the show in a minute with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it!
Dollar Shave Club not only gives you an amazing shave, but they also make products for your hair, your face, your skin, shower, everything you need. And it's all their own original stuff. Dollar Shave Club has you covered. Head to Tomorrow right now. You can get your first month of their best razor along with travel size versions of shave butter, body cleanser, and yes, even butt wipes. That's right. I said it. Butt wipes for just $5. After that, replacement cartridges ship for just a few bucks a month. It's the DSC starter set for just $5. Exclusively at dollarshaveclub.com slash Stephen A. That's dollarshaveclub.com slash Stephen A. That's with a PH, not a V. We'll get into Mel Kuyper Jr.'s uh, mock draft a little bit more tomorrow as we preview the AFC and NFC Championship games get set, getting set for this weekend. But until then, we'll go to the phones real quick uh, before we get on out of here for the day. Let's go to Lawrence in Texas. You're live with Stephen A. What's up, Lawrence? How are you? Hey, Stephen A. Um, I just wanted to uh, hit on what you were talking about with the NBA. Go ahead. Uh, I totally agree with you. Uh, I'm a Hispanic male myself, and I, I know what it's like being racially profiled and stuff. But uh, there is a, a, a difference between that and hockey and baseball. You know, it's okay for them to, you know, hash it out. And, you know, they, they set a different standard in there, you know. And, and it also has to do with the broadcasters, you know. They seem to make it sound like, you know, let them hash it out in hockey and baseball. You know, it's it's like it's okay for them to do it. But when it comes to basketball, it's like the broadcaster, even the broadcasters in basketball, they say, no, it's it's bad. You know, don't let them do that. You know, I got a bunch you. of thugs. I got you. And, I, don't, you know? I don't have the time to get into all of that, but I hear you, and you're not totally wrong. But I appreciate the call. Thank you. John in Manhattan, you're live with Stephen A. Go ahead. Hey, Steven, how you doing? Well, getting back with the NBA refs, I just think they're trying to influence the show, like be part of the show. And I, it's like in Major League Baseball. Like for a while, they were throwing out players every night. But it, it, it's bad for the game, though. I mean, it's, it, 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 it's the, like you said, the thing is the, um, the fans are paying to see the, see the stars play, and they, when they get thrown out, it, it wrecks the game. Yeah, it does. I, I don't want to say it wrecks the game, but I think it's selling the image of the players. I think it's contributing to the negativity that is aimed towards players, you know, from critics who want to label them thuggish or beyond. I think the NBA officials need to get on board. It doesn't mean that you give them a pass or you absolve them from bad behavior. But at the same time, my God, Kevin Durant, LeBron James, Russell Westbrook, Steph Curry, these are people we pay to see. You're throwing them out of games? You're giving Courtney Lee a tech for talking to a player. He didn't even say anything to you as the official. That's a problem. It really is. Freddie in Indiana, you got 30 seconds. Go. Hey, Stephen. Hey, hey I just wanted to get two things. You got 30 the seconds. NBA, Go. The, the NBA is turning. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a smaller league now, but it's not Isaiah Thomas small. He's a special talent. We know, we know what he brings to the table. But small for me in the NBA is six two and up, and then a small center was six nine six ten. I told you you got said thirty seconds. That's the point you wanted to make that he's not really that small. Way too small to send a team to win, to send a team to win. And I, I, at the end of his career, I don't think no team will retire Isaiah Thomas's jersey. I got you. I appreciate the call. Thank you so much. It's not about retiring his jersey. That was a very weak call. It's about whether or not he deserved a video tribute after two years and twenty one games in Boston. That's what the issue was. Very weak call on your part. Do better next time. Do better. I'll talk to y'all in 22 hours from now. AFC NFC Championship game. More Stephen A. tomorrow. Peace and love. That's just a sign with me. I love doing Sports Center with him, particularly post fight when he has to school me and remind me that I'm trying to be slick with my college educated self. I love it. I'm talking about the great. Teddy Atlas, he's on the line with yours truly right now. What's up, buddy? How you doing, man? Hey, Stephen. How are you? I'm doing great. It's always good to talk to you. Talk to me about this fight coming up Saturday night. Errol Spence Jr. against uh, L- Lamont Peterson on Showtime. Your thoughts about that? I mean, for me, Spence is a monster. He's a beast. My son works for the Oakland Raiders, and he uses uh, that kind of verbiage over there in the NFL. They, okay. When they want to compliment somebody, the guy's a beast. Mm. And for me, the best way I could compliment Spence, usually I say things that are a little bit more complex sometimes, but um, it gets 
it gets right to the point. He's a beast and a smart beast. See, when I train fighters, sometimes I say like to Timothy Bradley, I say, look, we're going to be a monster in this fight, but we're going to be a smart monster. He's a smart monster. He's technically solid. He was an Olympian. Uh, he fought the best in the world in the Olympics internationally. Uh, so he knows he belongs at that level. He learned how to fight. He's a southpaw on top of it. He's physically so strong. I don't know how he makes welterweight. He's a big, strong guy. But most importantly, he's got that attitude. He's got attitude that I'm going to get you. You know, I'm going to get you, and you are not going to stop me. I remember years ago, Custom Honor, my mentor used to tell me, very few people get supreme confidence. Very few. The only two he ever saw that he thought had it was Muhammad Ali, Sugar Ray Robinson. And I, I think that I've seen certain guys that come very close to that supreme confidence. And Spence might be one of those guys that really means in supreme confidence that I don't think you can lose. I don't think I can lose. I don't think there's any way that I will not find a way, no matter what it takes, to win this fight. And having said that, he's fighting a guy in Peterson who's a solid guy. He's a solid guy. His MO is a little similar to Spence. You know, he likes to go after you. He likes to press the action. He likes to go downstairs, you know, to the basement. But the only difference is he's doing it with a guy who does all those things much, much better at a much higher level. Spence goes downstairs to the body. That, that's his forte. That, you know, that's what he all likes right. to do. But he doesn't just go downstairs. He takes over the whole floor. I mean, so at the end of the day, I see Spence, even with a solid – Peterson in front of him, I see Spence getting him out of there. Well, let me ask you this, Teddy. Has he really, uh, Errol Spence Jr., I love him. He's my favorite right now, I, him and Terrence Crawford. But I got to ask you, has he really been tested? Because even though he beat Kell Brook, that was after Kell Brook got softened up, particularly his eye socket, against Triple G. He fought Triple G before he fought Errol Spence Jr. I thought if he had, had he fought Errol Spence Jr. before the Triple G fight, had he, had had Kell Brook never had the Triple G fight, then I think Errol Spence Jr. might have had a toughest a tougher matchup against him. What do you say to that? There's my college friend with that college <laughs> wit. There he is. Yeah, of course you're going to come with the right question. Look, has he been completely, completely tested? In my eyes, very close. If if not completely, very close. Not just in the Brook fight. Which you're right, he got damaged, he got softened up against Golovkin, no doubt about it. But he was he's still a big welterweight. He's a solid welterweight. Before that he was undefeated. He was fighting in his home country. You fight in your home country, you have a lot more going for you. You have a whole country you don't want to let down. That is not an easy task for anybody. But there's a guy with 200, 250 amateur fights. He fought the best in the world. He fought some of these guys that are world champions now when they were amateurs. You still beating really good fighters, even though they're only three round fights. So in that way, I believe what I see. I believe what I'm getting and spent. I believe he's everything that I said the first five minutes of this interview. And I believe that he is in the most talented weight class there is, the most competitive talented in boxing right now, the welterweight class. I mean, that welterweight class is no joke. I mean, you got guys like Thurman, you got, you got Danny Garcia, you got Crawford, who you just said. Yep. I mean, you, you have a weight class there that is so, so full. I, I know there's somebody I'm missing right now. You got Thurman, you got Spence. Yeah, yeah, Sean you got, Porter. Sean Porter's tough. You he's got tough. Sean Porter. Porter he's, he's a little bit below those guys. Yeah, but, but he's tough. He's a, he's a tough guy. He's a load. He's a guy that brings it all the time. Well, and, and in Thurman, I mean, you might have the best athlete in boxing. Well, I mean, well, stay he's right a there. really athletic stay, guy who stay can right go inside and outside. Ted, Teddy, stay right there with Keith Thurman. We're talking to the great Teddy Atlas, box, boxing analyst extraordinaire, right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. I spoke to Errol Spence on First Take yesterday. He's about to come on his radio show after I hang up with you. This man sets up there and he says, Keith Thurman, he thinks Keith Thurman is trying to duck him. That's who he really, really wants. Is that just hyperbole? Is that just talking because you're trying to coax him into the big money fight? Or do you believe that Keith Thurman may be avoiding Errol Spence Jr.? See, that's a good question. I think that Thurman is a smart guy. If you're going to be a champion, you're going to be a guy that 
that Stephen A. and Teddy Allen is going to spend time talking about, you know what? You've got to be more than just that beast. Like I said before, you've got to be a smart monster. He's a smart guy. He's not going to take that fight now until it's big enough, until the money's there, until everything else is out of the way, and that's the last option, and it's the right option. Of course. So in that way, does that answer your question? Does that mean he's dunking him? Yeah, maybe he is dunking him. Does that mean he's afraid of him? No, not in well, that way. It just means that it does not make any sense for Keith Thurman right but, now, undefeated Keith Thurman right now, to be fighting a guy like Spence. Well, let me tell you why I think it makes sense to me, Teddy. Keith Thurman has already fought Danny Garcia. He's already fought Sean Porter. So what I'm saying is, who else is left out there for Keith Thurman to fight? That's the way I'm looking at it. Yeah, you know what? In his mind, as good as these guys are, they can still, it's kind of like as good as that steak is, they could still use a couple minutes on a barbecue, on a stove. They could just use a couple more minutes. And that's how he's thinking of it. He's thinking, you know, Spence is terrific. I know how good he is. I know what I have to deal with. But let him get a little bigger. Let him win this fight. Let him win another fight. Let him get a little bit bigger. And then also... He's coming off shoulder surgery. Let me, and that being Thurman, obviously, let me get another fight. Let me make another payday, and let's put this down the road a little bit, a little bit. Teddy Atlas right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. One of my last questions coming up. Terrence Crawford obviously is considered one of the best pound-for-pound fighters, if not the best pound-for-pound fighter in the world, even though some people would say Lomachenko is that dude. But you look at Terrence Crawford, he's absolutely sensational. He has decided to move up from the junior welterweight division to this division with Errol Spence Jr. He's going to fight Joe Horn. Everybody's expecting him to beat the Australian. And then after that, he sat up there and told me, Keith Thurman, Errol Spence Jr., Either one of them is fine with him. How do you believe Terrence Crawford is going to do on the elevated level of going up seven pounds to the welterweight division? And how soon do you think he'll end up fighting Thurman or Errol Spence Jr.? Well, he has it the right way because it's it's attached to weight. You know, the only the only way that he doesn't have his way at the next division the way he did at the last division, because he is that good. There's no doubt about it. The, his skill sets are there and his mind is there. You know, he's a guy who's reliable, he's consistent, he's mentally tough, he's been tested. So the only way that he doesn't get to that place and dominate the welterweights the way he did below that is size. Is if these guys, because they're really good and they're bigger. You know, that, that would be a hell of a fight to see Crawford on the outside trying to keep Spence from coming in, trying to see him, keep him from eating up real estate and eating him up next, right after that real estate, being able to counterpunch him, nail him big shots because he's a big puncher, being able to do all of that before he gets close to him. That would be a hell of a fight. Matter of fact, I know your main sport, I mean, you're good at everything, but your main sport is the NBA. For me, comparing Crawford and Spence, that's kind of like going and comparing LeBron James and Kevin Durant. It really is, because LeBron James would, of course, be spent. Physical, a physical monster, and obviously he has the skill set. Kevin Durant, longer, taller, faster, more slick. That's what you would be getting. You would be getting LeBron James, and you would be getting Kevin Durant. Who's better one-on-one? Teddy Atlas, I got to put you on the spot here, sir. Because based on your synopsis, based on based on your breakdown, you seem to believe that Errol Spence Jr. and Terrence Crawford are on an elevated level over Keith Thurman. Am I reading that correctly? No, it's just the inactivity. I mean, I I really like Thurman. I think he's the probably the most athletic guy. Pure athletic guy, inside, outside, legs. He could do all those things. These guys could do one thing or the other, but not as well, not not quite as versatile as, as Keith Thurman. I think he's the most athletic guy there is right now. The only thing about him, I mentioned it earlier, he's really smart. I mean, all these guys are smart in different ways, but he's really smart. I wonder how much he's dedicated to staying in this sport. That's the only thing that hits me a little bit when I look at him is how that he's made money already, you know, in a, in a short period of time. He's accomplished a lot in a short period of time. He's got a lot in front of him if he wants to. But how dedicated to the grind of the sport, to really, really the legacy, being the best in boxing, going through all the blood, sweat, and tears that's still in front of him, all the pain. 
that's still in front of him. How dedicated is he really to that? I'm not positive. I'll close it by saying this. I think Errol Spence would beat Keith Thurman. And I think Terrence Crawford, my only reservation about him is whether or not he'd be too small. But skill-wise, I think he's better than Thurman. I like Thurman a lot, but I don't think he's these two. Thanks a lot, Teddy. I appreciate you, buddy, as always. Thanks so much. My pleasure, Stephen. All right. The one and only Teddy Atlas right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. To it, last May 27th in Sheffield, England, this man went to the hometown of Kell Brook and via an 11th round KO captured the RBF welterweight championship of the world. He is the IBF welterweight champion of the world. He is getting set to defend his crown this Saturday night at the Barclays Center in New York City, Brooklyn, New York, against Lamont Peterson, the one and only Errol Spence Jr. What's going on, man? How are you? Hey, nothing much, man. Just getting ready. All right, you're on this media tour, man, and you're doing a lot of interviews and what have you. I want to make sure you're careful because you don't need to be tired Saturday night. You're going to be ready, right? Oh, yeah, I'm definitely going to be ready. Um, I had some interviews to do this morning, but I um, canceled them. Well, I appreciate you know, it's time, it's, it's time to get focused. I feel you on that. Uh, how? What, what are you expecting this fight Saturday night? What are you predicting? Um, I'm expecting Lamont Peterson to come in shape like he always does and, um, you know, try to bring the fight to me. And, um, you know, I'm predicting a, you know, one-sided, you know, great performance by myself in a W, of course. When you think about your skill set and what you bring to the table, you're 22 and 0. You got 19 knockouts. When you look at yourself right now, some people ask you, do you compare yourself to Floyd Money Mayweather, who you've sparred against, worked out with? I assume. Uh, but, but I want to know what kind of fighter. When you look throughout the annals of boxing history, and you think about the great fighters that have fought in this sport, who do you model yourself after? Um, I think I model myself after guys like you know Ray Leonard, uh, Terry Norris. Um, uh, Gerald McCollum, um, you know, Vernon Forrest, mm-hmm. you know, just to name a few. I like all of those names, but you said Terry Norris, and even though I like Terry Norris, Terry Norris, because he used to put people to sleep, I remember what, what Simon Brown to it, it, it did to him. <laughs> I mean, you, you didn't think, you didn't think I forgot about that one, did you? I mean, come on now, he had, he did have a questionable jaw, wouldn't just say, that is not you. Um, I mean, he had a question with drop, but he got knocked out by big power punches. I mean, he got knocked out by Julian Jackson, and yep. um, you didn't you didn't say what he did the second fight against Simon Brown. That's true, though. He beat Simon Brown by decision, gave him a boxing lesson, took him to school. I remember when he knocked out John the Beast Mugabe. Trust me, I know enough about Terry Norris. Make no mistake about it. But let me get back to you. We're talking to Errol Spence Jr. right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio because right now, when we see some of the great great boxers in the game, the Triple G's, the Canelo Alvarez's, others, you know, pound for pound wise, where do you put yourself right now? Um. Right now, I think I'm in the top five. Um, you know, I'm definitely not with number one. There's still a lot. Um, I know that this year that I am, you know, one of the best time prime fighters out there right now. Now, everybody's looking at Lamont Peterson as essentially a tune-up. We got Terrence Crawford moving up to the welterweight division after dominating at the junior welterweight spot. We've got guys like Keith Thurman, Danny Garcia, Sean Porter, and others in the welterweight division. Who's on your hit list? Who do you really, really want badly? I mean, everybody's on my hit list. I mean, Lamont Peterson, he's not – I mean, I don't consider him as a fighter at all. I mean, Lamont Peterson is a top-rated Westway. He's a guy that, you know, always comes to fight and always in tough, close fights. I mean, it's arguably he could – I mean, he won that fight against Danny Garcia. I mean, he asked people. So, I mean, he's a tough fighter, but I want to unify the bill, so – not looking past this fight. I want to get, you know, Keith Thurman in the ring and uh and unify the bill. Do you feel anybody out there is ducking you? Um, I mean there's a lot of fighters out there that I think that that's avoiding me. You know, I don't like to use the word ducking, you know, but they are they are fighters out there that's avoiding me. A lot of the top West ways are avoiding me. Have you concerned yourself with the fact that in some people's eyes you looked so great? Why would anybody want to risk their careers by fighting you a bit too early? As a result of that, you may not get the fights that you're in search of. Have you concerned yourself with that at all? I mean, that may that may be the fans 
the fans, um, you know, perspective. But I feel like as a fighter, you know, I mean, that's your mentality should be different from from a fan mentality or a spectator mentality. Mm-hmm. As a fighter, your your whole you know mentality should be like, I want to fight the best, I want to beat the best. Oh, this guy ha- has a belt, you know, I'm gonna try to take this belt from him. You know, recently when I spoke to when I spoke to Terrence Crawford, and we're talking to Errol Spence Jr., the IBF welterweight champion of the world, looking to unify the belts. He loved uh, Keith Thurman, which is something that he told me just a few days ago. But somebody else on the come up is one of the greatest in the world himself right now, Terrence Crawford. He was just a junior welterweight. He's moving up those seven pounds. He's got to handle business against Joe Horn. But then he says he wants you or Keith Thurman. What do you say to that? Oh. Um. I like his mentality. That's what he's supposed to want. And, um, you know, it's something that we definitely make it happen, especially, you know, with the guys in the suit, you know, go and talk about it and uh, try to get that fight made. I mean, he's across he's across the street, and I'm on the other side of the street, so that's something the guys in the suit got to discuss, and, you know, that goes past us just wanting to fight. Real quickly, one of the things that I just finished talking to Teddy Atlas about, boxing analyst extraordinaire for ESPN, I just finished talking to him about this. He was talking about, you know, your skill set and what you bring to the table. He said you're a monster. You're a smart monster. You bring a lot to the table and what have you. And he thinks that you could do a lot, but he was he was expressing surprise at your ability to stay at the welterweight division. Is it tough for you to stay at 147, or is that something that comes relatively easy for you? Um, I wouldn't say it's easy. It just takes it, – it's a lot of discipline. I mean, it's a lot of discipline and, um, you know, basically staying on top of your your, um, your diet and, and your weight. I mean, I woke up today only a pound over. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, I, I'm not going to say I make it easy, but, you know, I just stay disciplined and stay to my food regimen. And um, it, is, it, it, get, it is mentally taxing because you want to eat certain things and, right. you know, people around you might – be eating something and you can't eat that so i mean it, it is it is hard mentally but i mean as long as i say discipline i can make this weight for at least four or five more years yeah because i was getting ready to ask is that your way of saying that you know what two three big fights at the, at this weight at the welterweight spot at 147 and then after that you're going to move up to junior middleweight is that the vision that you have for the future or all you focused on right now is handling your business in this division Hello? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, I hear you. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's something I would do. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if, if if something presented itself where, you know, I could fight for a title at 154, mm-hmm. you know, I, I'll do that. I mean, if it was, um, it was a, it, it's an interest to me, but um, it's not something that I'm rushing at all. I got you. I mean, it's a lot of guys at 47 that still, my dream to be undefeated at 147, so that's my main focus. Last question to you. What's your prediction for Saturday night? We want to hear a prediction. Oh, my prediction for Saturday night is me getting my hand raised and, uh, you know, great one-sided performance. But my is going to put up a great fight. But I feel like you have the skills and the ability to negate anything that he does and, um, you know, put on a great show and a great performance for the fans. Errol Spence Jr., the reigning defending IBF welterweight champion of the world, going up against Lamont Peterson Saturday night at the Barclay Center in Brooklyn on Showtime. Don't miss it. Appreciate you, man. Appreciate your time. Good luck this Saturday night, and I'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Cowboys Nation. Oh, Lord, you're a Cowboys fan. I forgot <laughs> you were from Dallas, Texas. Oh, you, you, you just, I, I, and I got love for you, and that's what you're going to do to me. <laughs> Mention the Cowboys on this show. Oh, Lord. <laughs> and, and you know what? They, they shouldn't even be represented which, by you. You know that, right? Because you're a winner. You're a winner. <laughs> you can't say that about hey. the Cowboys. Hey, we'll be back to our glory day soon, man. Are you ready for this analogy for me to give this to you before I let you go? I you are twenty. You are twenty-two and zero. It's been twenty-two <laughs> years since the Dallas Cowboys won the Super Bowl. <laughs> Take it easy, man. We'll be back. You're whatever. Right. You've been saying they haven't said that since you were born. Yeah, we'll be back. <laughs> Goodbye, man. Errol Smith Jr., IBF welterweight champion of the world. He's a bad somebody, y'all. Make no mistake about it. Lamont Peterson. Good luck, my brother. Good luck. You will need it.